All right. All right, is my microphone on? Next door, they're gonna do it right now. And Mike Sweet's going over there, Brad's going over there. Hi everybody, happy Monday. It is a beautiful evening. I thought next week we, uh, uh, we would all, in, in honor of Columbia University, maybe we'll all go protest someplace and shut some, yeah? Did you guys see what's happening in Columbia? I mean, it's, it's like all these events and we just happen to have a class on Israel. It's, it's, is it needs to be louder? And uh, I mean, there's always something. And it's funny, we were listening to Fox News on the way in and I had seen a couple of clips from today and the protests going on at Columbia University. And they showed a shot of the campus and I noticed that all the tents were the same. Did you guys notice that? And so AOC said that this was an organic student led protest and so on. And I saw those tents this afternoon and I thought someone's funding all this, right? What, who, where's all that money coming from to set these guys up? It's just like Antifa and that was all funded. That wasn't grassroots, give me a break. And the, the whole idea, and, and then they, they mentioned it on Fox News that uh, the same thing, that they thought it was all funded. But uh, there was a, a Jewish professor who for some reason got locked out of off the campus and couldn't get in. And I don't know what's anybody here why he was actually locked out of off of campus. Anybody hear why? I, I didn't hear anything. I just saw a clip of him, couldn't get onto campus. And uh, a couple of people said uh, to Jewish students that they should get off of campus because they don't think that the university can protect them. This is in the United States of America in 2124, or 2024, I mean. <laughs> and it will repeat itself 100 years from now, the Lord tarries. And, <laughs> and again, I, I, have, I have several slides that I was going to do this in week one, comparing some of the things that are happening you know today in reaction to Israel and how uh, and how it parallels what happened in 1930s Germany uh, but the longer I wait to kind of do that section of this class the more things just keep happening I saw a picture of some brown shirts remember the you know the youth brigade in the Nazi Germany and the brown shirts and they were all lined up in front of a university hand in hand keeping Jewish students out of the university and now we got stuff happening at Columbia University and other campuses as well. I mean, we know the drill. So isn't it just astounding? And uh, one person commented about what they would do if they were president of Columbia University. I'd say to all the kids that were protesting to go back to your room, put all of your belongings in a, in a box, and then we'll talk. Because you're going to pick that box up and you're going to leave campus because you're breaking all of your... Uh, uh, behavior codes and and so on. In, in fact, the inciting of violence in and of itself should be criminal, let alone to be kicked off campus. But um, it's just, you open up the newspaper, but it's, as I always say, it's really hard to study biblical prophecy with the Bible open on one side of the desk and the newspaper on the other side of the desk. I get that the stage is being set. We're going to talk about the future and Israel's future today, but we're going to turn to uh, what God has said is Israel's future. Amen? Amen? All right. And we got way too much stuff, so we'll see how far we get tonight. But we have, uh, how many weeks do we have left after this night? I think we have four. four weeks left after tonight. So we'll get it all. Lord, it is. The world's just messed up. It's dark. Um, but you are light. And true light has come into the world. But men love the darkness, you say, because they're Deeds are evil, and uh, boy, it's just getting more and more clear to see light and dark, righteousness and unrighteousness, um, and uh, it just becomes more clear, and as it becomes more clear, Lord, we just pray and hope that more and more people in this country will turn to you, will turn to truth and righteousness and, uh, and your ways instead of the world's ways. Uh, I, I just hope that so many people across this country wake up and, and, uh, and know you as their Lord and savior and that because righteousness exalts a nation lord we want to we want righteous people who know your word to rise up at the local level at the state level at the national level lord um that we may know your your word i remember reading long ago when uh, legislation was passed it was common for legislators to say show me where it is written as in give me the biblical justification we are so far from that 
Lord. But our own hearts, Lord, turn to you and uh, trust in you with all of our hearts. And you then promise you will direct our, our ways and our paths. That sounds really nice. So Lord, direct our paths here tonight, this week, and all of our days. We pray in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, I forgot my clicker. That's what I forgot. I get all these things out. My clicker. And I am recording. Thank you all those who reminded me. I don't think any, any of you reminded me. One person on Zoom reminded me. I don't have my clicker. Shoot. I think I'll have to, uh, I'll just do it manually. I think I must have left it in the uh, Sunday room. Will you go down to the Sunday room and see if you can find it? Thank you. All right. So a little review from last week. Uh, I, I, I like Larry so much, I had to throw him in again. But in the end, it, his, his words when he conquers uh, Jericho in Josh and the Big Wall kind of sum up this whole class, right? God has given us this land. And we believe that or we don't believe it. We either believe God's covenant with Abraham or we don't. God gave a covenant to Abraham that said all this land and then the borders. We said, I bring back my borders chart here. Uh, I'm going to give to you and your descendants for how long? Forever. Forever. And that promise passed on to Isaac and then on to Jacob, who became Israel. And so it's that simple. And so it's their land. But we see that they've been kicked out of their land twice. Well, that's because you need to understand not the unconditional covenant of the Abrahamic covenant, but the conditional covenant of the Mosaic covenant. He said, when he gave them the law and said, you will be my people. If you follow these ways, I will bless you. But if you don't follow these ways, I will curse you or there will be consequences. So that is the, the conditional promise or covenant that God made with Moses that they were to follow. Did they follow it? No, as we saw last week, they didn't follow it. So all of the sworn judgments that are talked about in Deuteronomy 28, the, the second half or actually the second 70% of that chapter are all the sworn judgments, including being carried off to a land that your fathers didn't know, Babylon, and that's exactly what happened for 70 years. And if they still didn't follow your ways, God was going to send them into all the nations the next time. And that is exactly what, what happened. So first Babylon for 70 years, and then into all the nations from one end of the earth to the other, and that's where they were scattered in, in what is known as the diaspora or, or the diaspora. <clears throat> then the new covenant came, the next covenant. This was the covenant that Jesus made in his blood. So we just celebrated communion on Sunday, the bread and the wine. We do that to remember this event when he came to usher in this new covenant. Now, did the Jews accept this new covenant? or reject this new covenant? No, they rejected it. So they said, crucify him, since you rejected it, it says in Acts, because they refused to believe, Acts 19. And because they rejected the covenant, because they still did not obey the Lord their God, it says in Luke 19 that I will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls, and we will not leave one stone upon another. We'll look at this again when we look at the seven temples and the progression of the temples throughout history, biblical history. Uh, but that temple, Herod's temple, the second temple that was standing on the Temple Mount, was destroyed and, and uh, not one stone was left upon another. And then the Jews, as we saw, were scattered into the known Roman world. But God has said that he would gather them back again over and over. I will bring them out. I will gather you from all the lands. I will bring you into the lands. I will gather you again. And that's exactly what happened. So after World War I, when the British took control of this area called Palestine, which is really Israel, the Romans just renamed it as we saw, they said, let's give all of Palestine to the Jews. All right, that sounds like a good plan. But the Arabs didn't like that. So by the time we get to World War II, that had been divided into 75% for the Arabs. So we have Arab Palestine, and we have 
Jewish Palestine, 25% of Palestine. There's your two-state solution, the original two-state solution. We have the Arab portion and we have the Jewish portion. And by the way, if you were an Arab, you could stay in the, the plan was you could stay in the Jewish portion or vice versa, but they came 49, kicked all the Jews out and you couldn't, but Israel still has 20% Arabs in it to this day. And they live with constitutional freedoms, just as the Jews do on the, on the Israel side. But by the time World War II ended and Israel actually became a state, the Arabs complained even more and the amount of land that actually became the state of Israel when they were born in a day was significantly less. Take out all the grade area and that portion was designated as the Arab portion again. Another two state division. Israel became a nation May 14th, 1948. Can a nation be born in a day? Yes, it can. And through a series of wars, we went through the maps, the, uh, the, the war right when they were founded, uh, invaded by five armies, uh, five nations, the armies of five nations, Arab nations, the Six Day War in 1967 and various other wars, 1972, the Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur War and so on. They took control of the, the Upper Sinai. They took control of the West Bank. They took control of Gaza. They actually had control of the Sinai that which they gave back to uh, Egypt. Uh, oh, by the way, she's not here today. Somebody mentioned I had the wrong date, 1977. I did have the wrong date. She said it was 1978. It was actually 1979. So go figure. The, the peace agreement was 1979. And we finished, uh, Israel finished giving the Sinai back to Egypt by, I think it was 1981 or 82 is when it was fully given back to Egypt. So that was, a, <laughs> and we saw that uh, everybody on Zoom, I'll remind you to mute yourselves. Let me pull up the participants. Can I do it? Oh, yeah, I can do it right here. That's it. So I left this in my Sunday class. There we go. Now it's working. And uh, I remember I showed you this map before. I'm sorry, let me go back one. So this is where we stand today. And you think, okay, so Arabs have 22 nations. They have all of what's now Jordan. That's the Arab portion of Palestine. And actually they control and administer through the Palestinian Authority, much of the West Bank, and they have Gaza. And you think, okay, you got most of the land. Can the Jews just have this sliver? But no, they can't. Because how the world, the, not only the Arab world and Mus the Muslim world, but much of the world world basically sees this. Now, I, told, I showed you this when I was on MSNBC. This is the map that I have. It's the same set of maps. And this is all over the internet. You can find it. That, oh, there's Palestinian. You see how, the, how Israel has been taken over Palestinian land all these years. Well, you now know that that's a complete lie because you now know the real history of Palestine is really the land of Israel. But that doesn't stop. Now, this is, this is new from last week. That doesn't stop uh, uh, places like, this is the Garnett Education issued this map. They say occupied Palestine on their map there. They don't even call it Israel. They don't even call it Israel. This is an atlas that Collins, Harper Collins made for some of the schools in the Middle East. And again, they don't even show Israel on the map. They don't even show it on the map. It doesn't even exist. It's because they don't believe it has a right to exist. They believe that they're foreign occupiers in this land. And once again, we know now that that's not true. What is Hamas and why is it fighting with Israel in Gaza? This was an interesting BBC article. The group Hamas, whose name stands for Islamic Resistance Movement, wants to create an Islamic state in place of Israel. Hamas rejects Israel's right to exist and is committed to its destruction. That's in their charter. They've stated it over and over again. So does Hamas want a two-state solution? No, they don't want a two-state solution. They want a one-state solution. They want one state of Arab Muslim Palestine. Because, you know, 
there's all this history of the Palestinian people and culture and language and capital. And no, there's none of that, right? We, we'll look at a little bit more of the history. Oh, I didn't read the other one. Why won't Palestinian Arab leaders recognize Israel's right to dis exist? Despite offers of statehood ever since the Oslo Accords in 93 and 95, they insist that all, all of what was Palestine belonged to them and that Israel must be destroyed from the river to the sea. Palestine must be free. So that's what they want. So when you sigh, when you wave your Columbia students, when you wave, wave your Palestinian flag and you chant that chant, what you're really chanting is the destruction of the nation of Israel and the people in it. And that's what you're chanting. And if I was a university professor, I would not tolerate that. To call for the wiping out of 6 million Jews in Israel. There's a great article uh, called The Palestinian Myth. And I'm going to send this in the email, in the follow-up email after tonight's class. Because you guys got to read it. Because it just has some really great information. But it goes through that, for example, in the 1300s, uh, people knew that this was this Palestine was the land of Israel. Jewish. This was the Jewish land. They knew that. Uh, a Dutch scholar in the in about 1700 said most of the land was empty, desolate. Its inhabitants few in number and mostly con concentrated in Jerusalem, Jaffa, and so on. Uh, most were Jews, and the rest were Christians, Arab Christians, or Christians from around the world who had moved to Israel to be close to Jerusalem where their Lord was from. And, and, and it was a wasteland that didn't have very many people. It was no Palestinian nation in Israel. It was basically a wasteland. Uh, another British quote there, you can read it in the article. One that is often quoted is Mark Twain's quote, who visited the land of Palestine in his day. And he says, there's not a solitary village throughout its whole extent, not for 30 miles in either direction, one may ride 10 miles uh, thereabouts and not see another 10 human beings. Nazareth is forlorn. Jericho lies in moldering ruin. What's a moldering ruin? I don't know what that is. Uh, Bethlehem and Bethany in the poverty and humiliation. Uh, I can't read that. Untenanted by any living creature. A desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent mourning expanse, mournful expanse. We never saw a human being in the whole route. There was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere and so on. It was a desolate wasteland. Nobody wanted to live there. No nation lived there. No people lived there. You had a handful of Jews. You had a handful of Arabs, mostly Christians, and in a couple of cities. And that's how it existed in 1867. In fact, when the general uh, from Britain came and took over the land after World War I, uh, he actually did a, a census. Uh, there was about a half a million people there, about 10% were Jews, and the rest were uh, a, a variety of other folks, Arabs, mostly Christians. And yet, this idea that there's this, this great Palestinian history this great Palestinian nation that has lived in the land all these times. One Israeli politician said, there is no such thing as a Palestinian nation. There is no Palestinian history. There's no Palestinian language. And that was extremely offensive to the world. And yet there's actually been in history, PLO leaders that have basically said the same thing, that the Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of the Palestinian state on, is only a means for the continuing our struggle against the state of Israel. So you've got a group of people here who are suddenly what? They're pawns in this chess match that we leave them there to pressure Israel, attack Israel, uh, to, to try to divide the land up more and more and more. And uh, I think that's the, the, where, how they serve. That's the purpose they're serving in the land. An Arab American journalist basically said the same thing. There's no Palestine, but that, but those weren't offensive. But if a Jew says it, it is offensive. The land of Israel, Jerusalem, Jordan, Hebron, Galilee, Bethlehem, Joppa, 
all the places of the Bible, Mount Moriah, which is also known as Mount Zion or the mountain of the Lord or the holy mountain or the temple mount that we would call it today. These places are all mentioned in the Bible over and over and over. Jerusalem, I think, 800 plus times in the Bible. This is the land of Israel. This is their historic land. And you could go on and name 50 other places and cities in Israel proper mentioned in the Old Testament and new. Uh, since the time that Moses and Joshua brought the people into the land. The Arab Muslims claim it, and yet if you do a survey of the Quran, what do you find? You find that the land of Israel is never mentioned. There's about 60 references to the children of Israel, meaning the Jewish people, and there were Jews, so you can understand why they would use the phrase children of Israel, but the land is never mentioned, nor is any city. Jerusalem's not mentioned, Jordan, Hebron, Galilee, Bethlehem, the Temple Mount, zero, zero times. Whose land is it? I mean, isn't this overwhelming when we go through the narrative and the, it is overwhelming. And so, you know, we've talked about this. This is a rendering of Solomon's temple. This was built in 1000 BC and stood until 586 BC until who destroyed that temple? See if you've been paying attention. Who? I heard it. Nebuchadnezzar. The next temple was destroyed by the Romans, right? We'll go through that. I got a handout. That'll be next week. You'll, you'll get all the temples down pat in my handout. But we have evidence. For the first temple, the second temple, we have evidences for the kingdom of David. I just saw in my feed yesterday uh, one of the stones that was found, because a lot of universities have and, and historians have said, oh, there's no evidence outside the Bible that David was ever king of Israel. Well, guess what? They found a stone up in northern Israel. And it says something about the kingdom of David on the stone. And that stone is sitting in a museum today because it's an extra biblical source of evidence that, yes, David actually was the king of a real Israel. And just because the Bible says it, I know you don't believe it just because the Bible says it. So it's been verified outside the Bible that there was actually a kingdom that a guy by the name of David was king over. Cool. Cool. Everybody should go home now and stop protesting, right? The point is, one of the things I didn't get to last week was this idea of this regathering. And, and just look at the history of the world to see how God has been, um, has used events of this world in this world to bring people back to his land. So post pre-World War II, Jews were fleeing Nazi Germany before it arose. After World War II and the Holocaust, we all know what happened, displaced persons from the Holocaust across Europe. There was about 700,000 Jews who said, okay, we've had enough. We're never going to be safe in Europe again. We're going to leave Europe and we're going to go to Israel. After... Wasn't that regulated also that they wouldn't allow so many in? Pre-World War II, after the Balfour Declaration, before the state of Israel, when Jews did start moving in, that's the 200,000 or so fleeing Nazi, uh, the British put restrictions on Jewish immigration into the land because, because the Arabs were getting all upset again. Well, you can't let this many Jews into Jewish Palestine. Do you see this theme, how it's been playing out for decades and decades and decades? After the Arab-Israeli War, uh, it became very dangerous to be a Jew in any Arab country throughout the Middle East, and so they all fled. Today, in fact, for decades, it's been illegal for a Jew to enter into the country, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You couldn't do it. It was illegal. They wouldn't let you in. Even in more recent history, do you guys remember all the fall of the Berlin Wall? Soviet Union fell a couple of years later, and there were a 
about 1.6 million Jews across the old Soviet Union that left that old communist dictatorship or, or the areas of that old communist dictatorship and emigrated to Israel. And in the last 30 years, 60,000 from Russia, 20,000 from Ukraine. Western countries are seeing record numbers of people, even after October 7th, which you would think if you're a Jew and you saw October 7th, you'd say, well, okay, no, you know, Tel Aviv is a nice place, but, you know, it's partly cloudy with a chance of rockets every day, you know, and don't want to do that. So I'm not going. But yet there are record. Cheryl, you work for uh, some airline, right? And you, you actually see this where people are, book, Jews book one-way tickets to Israel, right? A whole bunch of little babies, you can see, you know, the infant seats are always pink. They're yeah. Looking at the so, so you see it. Yeah. There, and so that's the aliyah, the going up. What, what, and I've heard this from many Jews over the years, that there is this internal calling of some sort where they, they just, I feel like I need to go back to Israel. And that's called Aliyah, going up. So as of today, so this is, these are world events. We've all seen the headlines. And yet God is using these events to draw Israel back to Israel. Do you see that? So as of today, um, this is actually was from uh, a while ago. So I updated the numbers. That's why the circles aren't perfect circles anymore. So I updated the numbers. As of today, there's about 6.3 million Jews in Israel. There's about 5.7 million Jews in the United States. The total world population is uh, just short of 16 million. And some of these other numbers are relatively the same 10 years later after this chart. So I didn't update all the numbers. But you can see in France, there's about a half a million. In Britain, there's about 300,000. Um, Ukraine is probably down and Russia is probably down. I didn't check. Oh, here, I got the next one. So here is a current statistics. So here's the 6.3 million, 5.7 million in the United States. And you can see the, the countries um, throughout the world where most of the rest of the Jewish population is. So that's the Jewish population of the world. What do you suppose God is going to do to draw the rest of Israel back to Israel. I mean, are we getting a foretaste of this by seeing events like the protests and the Columbia University stuff and things like that? Are we getting uh, a taste of this right now? And how bad is this going to actually get so that more and more Jews decide to make Aliyah? and go back to Israel. I don't, I mean, I don't know the, I'm not predicting anything, but I look at how God has worked in world history uh, over the last decades from, since the formation. And he said, I will gather, regather Israel back to Israel. I also don't know, by the way, we're going to get into the end times. I don't know how much of Israel needs to be back into Israel for the end times, which we're going to look at tonight, for the end times to begin, which begin with what event? The rapture. So this does not mean that the rapture can't happen until all the Jews are, are back in Israel. I don't think that's what that means, or I don't mean to imply that at all. Israel has something called the law of return, that you can return to Israel. And if you are Jewish, uh, they will, uh, you will you are granted citizenship uh, basically immediately. And so it's, it's uh, uh, ethnically, if you are Jewish and return to Israel, you can become a citizen right away. The land is also a very interesting story. Okay, that was the people. Now the land. Here's Mark Twain. Here's uh, a, a, somebody connected this picture. I don't know if this is an actual picture from his trip or not. I'm assuming so because it was connected. And he's looking out over the Judean desert and he's seeing nothing. This is a picture near Jerusalem. Uh, back around the turn of the last century. And, uh, and it's just a wasteland. Here is actual Jerusalem. Here's a couple of British soldiers in 1917 when after World War I, when the Ottomans were conquered and moved out and the Brits moved in, you can see that it's 
a virtual wasteland, can't you? There's nothing there, nothing. Nobody wanted to live there. But in days to come, Isaiah says, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. And guess what? Not only are we seeing the fulfillment of prophecy of Israel returning back to Israel, we are seeing the fulfillment of prophecy of the land blossoming. Now, I think the fullness of these prophecies of Israel's blossoming will be during the millennial reign, which we'll look at tonight, but we are already seeing it happen. So that if you, if you look at hundreds of millions of trees have been planted in Israel, agriculture is now massive in Israel. When you go to Israel and you drive through the country, you see farm after farm after farm. You see orchard after orchard. They have drip irrigation. They have over a million date palms have been planted. And you see them all along the roads everywhere you go. They have desalination plants. I think they have eight major desalination plants to provide water. So you see farm after farm. You see woodlands, trees, forests that they have planted. Grove after grove of these date palms. Here's the dates all growing up in the date palm. How many have been to Israel again that you've, and you drove when you're driving through? Well, a lot of you have been to Israel. When you're driving through, don't you see acre after acre of this? This is a picture of the Jerusalem forest right outside Jerusalem. This was not there when Mark Twain was there. The land is blossoming once again. Turn to Ezekiel 37. How many of you have heard of the prophecy about the dry bones? The valley of the dry bones. This is, this, this is really cool. Um, and, and what we're going to do, we're going to see the split of this prophecy in a way that, that um, how do I say this? Not everybody sees it this way, but most people that have this kind of traditional dispensational view, which we'll talk more about, that I have, will see it and teach it this way, absolutely. And I, I think this is evident, and I think you will too. Okay, Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Can they? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Verse 4, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath enter you and will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So we have this valley of dry bones that Ezekiel sees in this vision. And he's supposed to prophesy to these bones. And it says that I, the Lord, will attach tendons to them. I will make flesh come upon you and will cover you with skin. And then he says, I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Question. Is, has Israel come to life? Do they have breath in them? See, I love to ask questions like this because half of you are saying yes, and, and about a third of you are shaking no, and the rest of you aren't budging. So <laughs> I don't know yet. I don't know. Does, is Israel, do they have breath in them? Let's keep reading. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise and a rattling sound, and the bones came together. This is just like out of a movie or something, right? <laughs> the bones coming together. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. 
Do they have breath in them yet? Does Israel have breath? Do they know that he is the Lord? He doesn't. They don't, do they? No, the bones are coming together. The flesh is being put on. The tendons, the muscles, and so on. And the body is being built. It's about half done, I would say, right? Now, I don't, I don't, I'm just making an analogy to the number of Jews back in Israel. But the body is absolutely being assembled, but there is no breath in Israel yet. Do you see that? No breath yet. No life yet. Ezekiel 37, 8. I read that already. But there was no breath in them. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So one day they are going to have breath in them. One day they are going to come to life. One day it goes on to say they will have God's spirit in them, but that's not yet. I will put breath and all Israel will be saved. Romans 11. Zechariah 12 says, They will look upon me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn. And finally, 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 the descendants of Jacob will believe and be saved. Well, when is that? When does that happen? So now we enter into what's next for Israel. What's the future of Israel? Because I, I read a, a article this week, and it was a, a guy that said, I'm going to ask five of my uh, favorite theologians about Romans, and you know, what's their favorite passage, what's the most difficult passage, and so on and so forth. And several of them mentioned about difficult passage, Romans 11, 26, all Israel will be saved. What does that mean? It's, it's not hard at all. We're going to see it. We're going to see exactly what God said is going to happen. And he says, in Matthew 24... If you recall this sermon by Jesus, the disciples, this is the, the final week of Christ's life. They're going away. This is this discussion of, do you see all these things? Not one stone will be left upon another. And if you were to pro prophesy that, oh, Grace Church is going to be knocked down and not one brick is going to be left upon another, what might be your next question? When? That's exactly what they ask him. When will this happen, Jesus? Does he actually answer that question, by the way? No, he doesn't answer when will the temple be destroyed. You know the answer, right? 70 AD. That's when it's so 40 years later, less than 40 years later, that temple is going to be destroyed. But then the second part of their question is this. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Did you guys know there's, the, there's an end of the age? Do you guys know this is all going to come to an end? Yeah. It is. It's going to come to an end. And it's very easy because here's the chart. <laughs> there it is. I love to show this chart. This is a, a chart by a guy by the name of Clarence Larkin. And Clarence Larkin wrote a book. Uh, it has a lot of different subjects in it, but he, he was a draftsman and he drew what he studied. Now, I like to draw and chart and list what I study, but I always use a computer. I was a consultant and I use a computer. He was a draftsman and he kept all of his pens when he became a pastor and he would draw these beautiful pictures. And once you look at this, it's actually not that hard to understand, to be honest with you. You're all go through, going through Revelation. You should be able to explain this whole chart. There's only a, there's only a couple things on this chart that I would like to change. Otherwise, I agree with this whole thing. And Clarence Larkin lived over 100 years ago. I, you know, I've never met the guy, but we had the same source material and my chart, which is a lot e easier. Well, this isn't mine. I, I thought I had mine next, but this is a, a very simple chart of what God says is going to happen at the end of the age. So we're right here, right? We're in the church age after the cross, before the rapture of the church. So we know we're there because it says that's where we are. You are here. All right. 
The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. The trump will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds, and there we will be with the Lord forever. Now in my end times class, we talk all about it, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about it tonight, but we actually go through all of the biblical reasons why I, I believe, and I've come to the conclusion that the rapture has to happen before God pours out his wrath on the earth. How many heard the sermon this week on uh, Sunday? Uh, Troy was talking about, actually, the wrath of God in these seven angel judgments, which are going to be the seven bowls, which are going to be poured out in the next chapter, Revelation 16. You learn about that next week. And he says, in that, the wrath of God is complete. That's the wrath of God. Are you under the wrath of God or not? No. In fact, Troy explained that, that we are no longer under the wrath of, wrath of God. We're no longer under condemnation if we are in Christ Jesus. So we are not appointed to suffer wrath. Right, Scripture says, and First Thessalonians declares that a couple times, that he will keep us from the hour of trial that is coming upon the world. And in context, that's the tribulation. And we are kept from that. So were you going to raise your hand? Okay. Um, but in my end times class, I actually have 10 biblical reasons. That's on the internet if you want to watch it at some point in time. Or am I going to do the end times in the fall? I was just talking to my wife about what, what am I going to, huh? Take a poll. <laughs> well, I know a lot of them are, or have already been to it, but who, okay, I, I will. Who would like to see, the, do, <laughs> hands, bunch of hands, all right. The end times class in the fall. Yeah, all right, maybe we do that. So I haven't done it for a few years. I usually do it every other year. I haven't done it for a few years. Because, well, we happen to have a senior pastor who decided to go through Revelation, right? So I didn't want to be doing my class when he was doing his. But he is done in July, I understand, which means that by about September, we could do the end times class again, I guess. So, all right, maybe I'll do that. That sounds like a good idea. Then there's a seven-year tribulation period. We know it's a seven-year tribulation period because remember when I mentioned Daniel 9 and the prophecy in Daniel 9? That that prophecy not only predicted when Jesus would come the first time, yes, the timing of Jesus' first coming is prophesied in Scripture, and Daniel chapter 9 tells us when. I know you all knew that he would be born in Bethlehem, and that he would speak in parables, and he'd be called the Nazarene, and he'd come up out of Egypt, and he'd be betrayed by a, a friend for 30 pieces of silver, and, and that he would be pierced for our transgressions, he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb, but he would not see decay and so on and so forth. There's about 100 unique prophecies for Christ's first coming. But one of them is when he would come, and that's Daniel chapter 9. Amazing prophecy. But Daniel chapter 9 also sets up the framework that there is a future seven-year period that comes upon the world after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And so we're still looking for that seven-year period. Because as, as far as I know, there's never been a whole bunch of locusts that have come up out of the abyss and tormented people for seven months, right? Anybody read that in history books? And by the way, Revelation 19 says that Jesus comes back riding on a white horse. And I know that hasn't happened yet. So there is yet a future seven-year period culminating in that second coming of Christ. He returns on a white horse. I'm going to read it. Revelation 19. Just because I, I love to read this passage. Revelation 19, verse 11. This is yet future. I'm a futurist when it comes to understanding the book of Revelation. You know that many in the church are preterists. They believe this has already happened. All these events that we've been talking about in big church have already come upon the world around 70 AD in the destruction of the temple. And you have to spiritualize the text. We are going to look at the frameworks that the two main frameworks in Christianity that, that will govern how someone will look at prophetic events. And it's basically covenant theology or reformed theology or dispensational theology. We will look at those. I don't know if it's next week or in two weeks, but we have to understand that. 
because there's a reason why people theologically have set Israel aside and said, no, there's no future tribulation, which scripture calls the time of Jacob's trouble. This is a future judgment for Israel. But if God's done for, for if God's done with Israel, is there any future tribulation for Israel? No. Why would there be? He's done with them. That's where we get replacement theology, and it all starts fitting together in their brain. We got to understand that, and we will. But that that's future. I digress. Christ comes and he establishes what? His kingdom. How long is his kingdom? thousand years how do you know that because <laughs> it says on my chart well that's not my chart that's a different chart. it actually says in revelation in fact oh i never read i never read this i get excited i saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true with justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Who is that? That's us. How are you dressed? White. What are you writing? Did you know that? You knew that? Just because you've been into another class of mine? Yeah, well, it's in the Bible, too. So, so you know I've named my horse, right? I've already named my horse. You don't remember what my name my horse? Thunder. Thunder. You can't have that name. It's already taken. My horse's name is going to be called Thunder. And then my friend Brian DeVries, who co-teaches In Search of Truth with me, always says his name is, a horse's name is going to be called Lightning, because lightning always comes before thunder. <laughs> that was a pretty good line, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. All right. Dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. That's Armageddon. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. I love to read that passage. He doesn't come back as a little baby in a manger, does he? Eyes ablaze, a sword out of his mouth with which to strike down the nations. And he treads the winepress of the wrath of God. That's the second coming. And he comes as king of kings and lord of lords to establish his kingdom for a thousand years on earth. This is, and, and then, then we have the new heaven and new earth. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is my chart. Can't you tell I was a consultant? Yeah, this is just done in PowerPoint. And so... This chart, you guys all have a copy of it. You Zoom guys, I will send this out uh, in the email, and I'll, I'll try to get the email out. I've got a meeting. By the end of the day tomorrow. All right? Hmm? I'll get it. I'll, I'll get it out by the end of the day tomorrow. I've now committed to it, so I have to do it. Um, so this is the chart that I basically use as the my core chart i call it my anchor points chart because it has all the main points uh, of the end times in it so you can see on the far left we've got the rapture of the church we have the seven seal judgments seven trumpet judgments we have the seven bowl judgments this is the revelation 16 stuff that we'll talk about next week in big church we see the abomination of desolation at the midpoint of the tribulation uh, you guys have, we've talked about that a little bit in big church as well. We got the first half, we got the second half, we got the second coming of Christ. And then we have this line here, this, this verse, Romans eleven twenty six. all Israel will be saved. So in this class, this is kind of our focus, but I want everybody to have the big picture in their head because it will make a lot more sense what we're talking about 
in terms of Israel's future salvation. Jesus then comes and sets up this millennial reign, which lasts a thousand years, at which time scripture says heaven and earth flee from his presence. They go away and there's a new heaven and a new earth and eternity begins. And we'll talk about that. The sheet tonight, the sheet that goes with this is extra verses because the chart gets kind of crowded. So everywhere you see a little blue diamond here, there, those are the extra verses linked on the second page that kind of go with this chart. Everybody follow that? Yeah. All right. So that's yours. That is, this is everything on here has a biblical reference and you can look it up and so on. And remember, uh, uh, I say this all the time, you need to know this. And so I'll remind you, you need to know what you believe and why you believe it from scripture, right? So I love a good teaching, love a good teaching if it's consistent with the word of God. I have gleaned things from teachers that it's like, oh, we were just talking about it. I have, a, I have a list of things. It's like, oh man, I've never seen that before. And you hear something from a teacher and you go, yeah, but then you better research it and come look at the passages and study it yourself and come to your own conclusions. Be that good Berean as always. So there's my little be a good Berean exhortation again. So uh, I've kind of already walked through there, this. I, I should have been doing this slide as I was describing it, but we have the rapture. We have the seven-year tribulation with, with the seals, the trumpets, and the bold judgments, the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, the second coming, the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment, which is judgment day. That's the final judgment. That's when the lost are judged at the great white throne judgment. And then eternity. There's a new heaven and new earth. So that's the overview. Any questions? I, I want to spend a couple minutes on each of these in just a minute. So you just mentioned when um, people are finally coming to Jesus, that is towards the end. When Israel, let me go back to the, to the chart and the big chart. When Israel finally recognizes their Messiah when he's returning right here, they will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will finally recognize him. So that's the, that's the core of why we're going to kind of go through this whole scene to see this event, that there is yet a future day of salvation for the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? Anything else before we get into a little bit more detail in this? You guys see why we're doing this? All right. It is fascinating to me that there are so many in the church that don't believe there's a rapture of the church. Uh, when we get to these two frameworks of understanding scripture, kind of covenant slash reform theology versus dispensationalism, you'll see why this become more clear how they see the Bible and how they see scripture. But I have no idea what those folks do with this verse. It's one of the core, one of two core rapture passages. This is from 1 Thessalonians 4. But it says, The Lord himself will come down with, from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ, where are the dead in Christ, by the way? Where are they? In heaven. Everybody understand that? Absent from the body. No, they're not sleeping. There are some who teach this idea of soul sleep. I don't know where they get that in the Bible. We actually have a number of instances where people after death are very much aware and awake and alive and are communicating to each other. Luke 16, Lazarus, the rich man in Hades, um, and so on. So Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord, not sleeping at his feet, right? So I think it's very much a conscious existence when you are absent from the body and at home with, with the Lord. And by the way, the Lord is where? At heaven, seated at the right hand of God. So we will be with the Lord in heaven. We know that biblically. So that's where the dead in Christ are. After that, we who are still alive and are left, who's that? Us. 
I still, I've been teaching this for 25 years. I still plan to be raptured. <laughs> Next Tuesday. <laughs> it's better by far, by the way. God says it's better by far. All right. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Where do we meet the Lord? On earth? Up in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The rapture is our blessed hope. It is a source of encouragement. We're supposed to look forward to the day of the Lord's appearing. And we do. And so we should be able to say, based on our walk with the Lord, Lord, today would be a good day. And I, you know what? I think God has intended every generation from the first generation to live as if the rapture could happen in their generation. If you understand the book of Thessalonians, as a matter of fact, they thought they were already in the tribulation, that they thought they kind of missed the rapture, and so they even believed that the end times could be in their generation. And I think every generation of Christian sense could honestly believe and understand scripture, scripture to say that the rapture could happen in my lifetime. And I think that's exactly how God wants us to live. Amen? That today could be the day. This is called the rapture. If you don't believe in a rapture, what do you do with this passage? I've never heard an explanation for this passage by those who say there's no rapture. Uh, by the way, where do we get the term rapture? Rapturo. Rapturo. Very good. Caught up in the Greek is harpazo. What'd you say? Oh, rapturo. That's not rapturo. But most many uh, theologians centuries ago studied in what language? Latin. What's the Latin word for caught up? Rapturo. So you can call it the rapturo. You can call it the harpazo. You can call it the catching up. You can call it any of those things. It doesn't really matter what you call it. One of the I make a big deal out of that because one of the arguments is, is that, well, the word rapture never occurs in scripture anywhere. And it's like, well, yeah, actually it does. It's right here, just in Latin. By the, word, by the way, the word Trinity never shows up in scripture either. It's just a theological term that we gave this event when we're caught up to him in the clouds. Uh, any questions on the rapture other than when it's going to be? By the way, it, God tells us when it's going to be, by the way. There you go. It comes as a thief in the night when you're not expecting it. That's when the rapture is going to come. Jesus says at the end of the book of Revelation, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me. And that word soon in the Greek is the Greek word. No, teku, T-A-C-H-U, teku. And that word could mean soon, but how long has he waited so far? A couple thousand years. Well, that doesn't sound soon to me, so what does that mean? Well, the Greek word teku can also mean suddenly, which I think is actually a better translation. I'm coming suddenly, and my reward is with me. I come as a thief in the night. Cool. We'll look at Noah's comparison in a minute. Let's get through the timeline. The tribulation, seven years. We know it's seven years because of Daniel 9. Like I said, there's a first half. We have this woman riding the beast. This beast is coming to power with this mystery Babylon, this harlot. And then the beast decides, you know what? I'm going to set myself up as God in the temple of God. I no longer need this woman, this mystery Babylon, so I'm going to destroy her. I'm going to cast her aside, and now I'm going to set myself up as God in the temple of God. What does that mean about the temple mount? There has to be a temple there. There has to be a temple standing on the temple mount by the midpoint of the tribulation. You guys see that? Now, I don't know when it's going to be built. Scripture doesn't tell us when it's built, 
but I know it has to be standing by the midpoint of the tribulation. Then there's the second half. We got the Antichrist. He makes war against Israel. That's when Israel has to flee into the wilderness where she's taken care of for three and a half years. Remember Matthew 24, pray that your flight doesn't take uh, place on the Sabbath and all that kind of stuff. So that Israel flees because, because the world wants to destroy Israel. Can you fathom that today? And so she goes into the wilderness where she is protected or nourished by God for three and a half years. That's the second half of the tribulation. Now, it doesn't say how or by what means, if it's supernatural or what. We just, we don't know. It just says that she's nourished. We also don't know where the wilderness is. Some say where? Petra. Petra. Maybe. I don't know. That's one theory. And it's a common theory, so you see it a lot. But actually, Scripture doesn't say we have this character called the Antichrist, also known as the Beast. I said all those. He makes war. Uh, he has a buddy called the False Prophet. And the False Prophet is actually the one who institutes the Mark of the Beast, which is the number 666, the number of his name. And we don't really know what that looks like or how, how that's enforced. But can we see things in this world today that look like they they have the flavor of the mark of the beast. And it says in scripture that people cannot buy or sell unless they have this mark. Do we see that today? And how do we see it today? How are we seeing it today? I just, I just read that Bank of America was canceling some Christian conservative organizations and saying, we don't want your business anymore, so you're out. They didn't do, break any rules. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything illegal. They just said, we don't like your kind around here. And they kicked them off. Bank of America. Bank of America. Which needs to be renamed something else. Because America doesn't stand for that. But this is happening around the world. How many of you have heard of the Chinese credit uh, social credit score? The Chinese social credit score is basically if you're a good citizen and you follow all the ways of the government, your score will go up. And if you have a high score, you can buy or sell. If you don't, you're limited on what you can buy or sell. This is coming to the United States. We already have forms of social credit scores in this country. Anybody besides me get kicked off of, tick, uh, of Twitter here a few years ago? Nobody? I'm the only one? Two? You're, gonna, you're not going to? Three? Well, congratulations. Way to go. The rest of you, what are you doing? Just posting pictures of your kids or something? You know, it's like, get out there and post some truth. So I got kicked off of Twitter like uh, a bunch of other people. And uh, this, is, this is social credit score. If your behavior and you don't align with the narrative that we are pushing, then we're going to kick you off of social media. You're not allowed to bank here. I know conservatives who were kicked off of Uber, who were kicked out of PayPal, who were kicked out of a number of, of these institutions just because of their beliefs, their political views. This is un-American, but this is the kind of social credit scoring system that we are already seeing the stage being set for. What's the mark of the beast? So you can't buy or sell unless you have this mark. There was going to be something that we all feared during COVID, something called a vaccine passport. You guys remember hearing about that? It was going to be a system that unless you do as you're told, you won't be able to travel or go outside or do anything else. That was a trial run. That was a trial run. Yep. Because I see vaccine passports in the Constitution, right? The federal government has the power to issue a... Oh, no, it doesn't say that. In fact, it says just the opposite. The World Health Organization is trying to get that go through now in May again. Yeah, so one of the scariest proposals out there right now is the World Health Organization proposal that the next pandemic that comes... We're actually a little late for the next pandemic, aren't we? Yeah. Just, um, that the World Health Organization would actually dictate to countries who signed the agreement how what would the response look like for that pandemic. So that means the United States would have to listen to the World Health Organization 
Uh, and if they said you can't leave your house for the next 21 days, the World Health Organization could dictate that to the United States of America. Once again, I would argue that's completely unconstitutional, but I, I, what percentage of our federal government, what they do today is not constitutional? I mean, it's, all right. And, but where was I? Oh, Antichrist. So he's the main bad guy of the end times, but it's actually kind of interesting. Almost every place that this bad guy is mentioned in scripture, it also mentions that he's going off to his destruction. <coughs> he is a defeated foe. And we're not going to see him anyway. We're going to be long gone. So should we be looking for an antichrist or should we be looking for a Christ from heaven? Yeah, I don't believe the Antichrist will come upon the scene until after the rapture of the church. So don't worry about him, church. Look to heaven because your Redeemer is coming. Look to, to Christ. But he has a whole kingdom. He rules this place kind of for seven years, not really in the first half because it's him and the woman riding the beast, but in the second half, definitely. By the way, this is the Tower of Babel. This is the EU headquarters. They modeled it after the Tower of Babel. Kind of like life imitating prophecy, kind of in a, some way. Um, look, the revived Roman Empire, the beast's kingdom, which, meant, which is the revived Roman Empire. If you understand Daniel and the imagery in Daniel and Revelation, this is the feet and toes of the, the statue. Do you guys remember the Daniel statue? The head is Babylon. Arms. Medo-Persia, yep, the Medes and the Persians. Who's the belly? Greece. Who's the legs? Rome. And then we have this future kingdom, the feet of ten toes. And that is the future uh, kingdom of the Antichrist. And so we see the symbolism of the ten in both Daniel and in Revelation. And anyway, I can't get into it. But at the end of it all, Jesus comes back. I already read that. And then we have this millennial kingdom. And this millennial kingdom is the kingdom that the Jews have been looking for. How many times in Scripture, in the Gospels, do you remember, you know, even when he ascends in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, are you now going to establish your kingdom? They were looking for it. Remember the woman said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, set one of my sons on your left and, and one on the right. They were looking for the kingdom. They didn't understand they, they understood the kingdom because the Old Testament talks about this kingdom so much that that's what they were looking for. They missed the passages where God says that he first had to come as a servant to be pierced, to die for the sins of the world. They saw the, the kingdom passages and they said, oh, that sounds really good. Are you here to bring that, Jesus? So it's a thousand years. Satan is bound. Christ reigns from Jerusalem on earth, from sea to sea. The whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Then they will know that I am the Lord. He's, he reigns the entire earth. Christians, now what body have we received by now? We will have received our glorified bodies just like Christ. And guess who gets to reign with Christ during that time? Us, in glorified bodies. We will reign over the people of the earth who are still in their earthly bodies, including the nation of Israel, who will enter into the millennial kingdom. The lion will lay, lay down with the lamb, right? Scripture says that. Some of you know me too well. No, it actually says the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them all. That's the millennial kingdom. So God is going to take this world. Is there peace on earth during this time? Yeah, men will beat their weapons into plowshares and there'll be peace on earth because the prince of peace will be here. He, we will live in a perfect government for a thousand years. No wars. Somehow the animal kingdom even changes. 
more like it was in the Garden of Eden, Scripture says. A glorious time. Not quite a full restoration of the Garden of Eden, however. That comes next. At the end of the thousand-year reign, Satan is released for a short period, and uh, there's one final rebellion. Revelation says that the breath of God came down from heaven and destroyed them. And that was the last rebellion. And then he says, heaven and earth flee from my presence. And he now makes a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Are heaven and earth together right now or apart? They're apart. For all of eternity, heaven and earth come together. Revelation says he makes this earth new. He makes all things new out of fire. You guys ever read 2 Peter chapter 3? So this earth is reserved for destruction with fire. And then after everything's burned up so hot, even the elements will melt. Now there's global warming for you for sure. <laughs> he then makes all things new. That, that is the final restoration of Eden. We hadn't seen that since Genesis chapter 2. And then we finally receive it back after, after Revelation chapter 21. And we now have the restoration of all things. And then God says this. He says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with man. Heaven and earth will be together. We actually don't spend eternity in heaven. Heaven and earth spend eternity together. Okay? And God will dwell or tabernacle with us forever and ever. By the way, I don't think that doesn't mean that we could not go exploring the universe because I fully expect us to be able to go explore the universe because he's created millions of galaxies and there's probably a lot of really cool things to see throughout the universe. So if you're all up for it, I'm, that's one of the things I want to do. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to need the tour too. I've never been there. So I'm... We get to ride our horses? Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of that, actually. That's a good question. They asked, could we ride our horses on the other galaxies? And so, yeah, why not? Um, but before that, there's this thing called the Great White Throne Judgment. This is when God's on the throne. Christ is on the throne. All authority has been given to Christ. We are on the throne. Don't you know that you will judge the world, Paul says? <laughs> Even angels, we have God, we have Christ, we have us, the righteous, in our glorified bodies, and before us is going to be all of the lost from the very beginning of time to the very end of time. A sea of humanity, and what happens to that sea of humanity? It says in Revelation that they are thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. They go away. They cannot enter into the new heaven and new earth because God says that nothing unrighteous will ever enter into it. So he throws them into the lake of fire. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So only the righteous enter into this new heaven and new earth this is when David said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever in this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven. So we talk about some of the characteristics of all that in the end times class. Um, I love this line, so I'll say it. Born once, you're going to die twice. If you're born twice, you're going to die once. You guys follow that? If you're born once, only out of water, as Jesus and Nic Nicodemus talked about, you're going to die physically, but you're going to die the second death, too, in the lake of fire. But if you're born again, born of the Spirit, you will die physically, maybe. We got this thing called the rapture coming, right? But the second death, the Revelation says, has no power over you. 
So you'll only die physically. And eternal life is a really big deal. So big. We should be sharing with people that we know that we have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life? First John 5 says, I write these things to those who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. Cool. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. This is, we see the streets of gold. We see the tree of life. We see the throne of God is there. God will dwell with man. I just read that verse. There's no temple in the new Jerusalem. Why not? Yeah, when we look at the seven temples, we'll look at that again, but it's really cool. There is no temple because what is the temple? That's God tabernacling with his people. That's how he tabernacled with his people. He will dwell with us. He will tabernacle with us in the new heaven and new earth in New Jerusalem. Streets of gold, pearly gates, the tree of life, that's the eternal state. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor is it in the mind has conceived what God has prepared for us, for those who love him. It's going to be even better than what you can even imagine. So if you're not excited for that, as Dave Gibson says, you don't have a switch, right? <laughs> if that doesn't turn you on, you don't have a switch. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the biblical timeline. It's pretty simple. It's very biblical. Um, and yet it's fascinating to me how much of the church uh, rejects this idea. Uh, because of, like I said, Reformed Covenant slash Covenant theology, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but because there's uh, other views out there. Thoughts on God's plan for the end of the age. That was a semester in like a half hour, by the way. <laughs> I thought I did pretty good. Thoughts on that? Is it real? You know, one of the reasons why I teach the end times is that I find that a lot of people don't have a very concrete understanding of their eternity. You know, the old adage, so I would be playing, you know, floating on a cloud, playing a harp. And do you get excited about playing a harp for all of eternity on a cloud someplace? I don't. But it's a literal, tangible kingdom. We will have literal bodies, our glorified bodies. We'll be able to sit down and eat together. Oh, is there eating in heaven? Yes, there is. In fact, one of the first things we do in the, in the millennial reign is we have a giant wedding feast, a banquet of the finest meats and the choicest wines, or the choicest meats and the finest wines. I think it's in Isaiah. And we will eat. And so uh, it's cool, but we'll never gain weight. <laughs> What's your favorite food? I'm sure it will be in heaven. I, I, if you read the towards the, this is a little known chapter back towards the end of the book. It says there are white chocolate macadamia nut trees that grow and pick them all you want. So that's God's plan for the end of the age. Matthew 24. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what was going to happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what's the picture? In the days of Noah... Noah knew a flood was coming, and he was told to build an ark. So he got busy building an ark. Did Noah know when the flood was coming? Did he know that a flood was coming? And then one day, God tells him, go into the, into the ark. And he goes into the ark, and the door is closed, and destruction comes upon them. 
it will be exactly the same at the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus says. We know there's a rapture coming, don't we? Do we know when it's coming? No, we don't. We don't know when, we just know it is. He's tasked us with a task as well. What's our task? Hmm? Yeah, go into all the world. Make disciples of all people. Preach the gospel. And all the church, one another, is that we build each other up, make disciples. Add, make the kingdom grow on earth, right? And then one day he, that trump will sound and the voice of the archangel and he will call us through the door in heaven. Remember Revelation chapter four, John on the island of Patmos saw a door open in heaven and it said, come up here and I will show you what will take place. That's absolutely symbolic of the rapture of the church. We are going to go through the door of heaven and then the destruction will come upon them just like in the days of Noah. Now, here's the thing about the days of Noah. It says they were eating and drinking right up until the day Noah entered the ark. Some teach that things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until the rapture of the church. Maybe. I, I don't know. Some actually think it's going to get better and better and better because we as the church are going to do a better job at what we're doing. I don't know. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. And there's still much of the world doesn't believe. All I know is that people will be eating and drinking in marriage up until that day. I don't know if it's gonna if there's gonna be a big revival. I I wish there was a giant revival in the United States of America in my lifetime, but I don't know. Will it get worse? Well, Christians have been persecuted in this world for 2,000 years. In this world, you will have trouble. We've been pretty protected in the United States because we have a a solid Christian plurality maybe today uh, that has meant that much of our laws and our government have been based on biblical truths. But that's waning, isn't it? So there are no guarantees. There are no promises. But just because the United States is falling from its great height doesn't mean that the end is near. The church is advancing in other places around the world. Europe used to be a church stronghold. Now it's, I don't, I don't know, the, some of the percentages in some of the European countries are like 1% are evangelical Christians. It's, it's amazing. Noah goes through the door, and then the flood will come. We go through the doorway of heaven, and then the tribulation will come. But he says, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be where I am, that you also may be where I am. Which way are we traveling? Is this the second coming or the rapture? The rapture. We're going up. I go and prepare a place for you. Jesus departs, goes to prepare a place, and I will come back and take you to be. The trump will sound, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. This is actually the first rapture verse in the New Testament. Cool. One day we will be caught up to heaven then destruction will come upon them. You guys see that? And then at the end, Jesus comes back to earth, riding his white horse with the armies of heaven following him, and Israel will be saved. On that day, he says in the Bible someplace in verse 9, in what chapter? I think this is Zechariah. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. That's Armageddon. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon me, 
the one that they have pierced, yeah, this is Zechariah 12, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. There is a day coming when Israel, a remnant of Israel, actually, which we'll talk about next week, is going to see Jesus return at the second coming. This is a piece of art, by the way, by uh, Pat Moraki. Mor Mor it's in a book called Reve Revelation Illustrated, and this is her depiction of Jesus on that white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth, his eyes ablaze, the crown on his head, the armies of heaven following him, each on white horses, wearing white and clean women. There, there's me right there. <laughs> and there's Brian on lightning right ahead of me. <laughs> he doesn't come back as a baby, does he? He comes back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, Zechariah 12, 9 through 10, right there. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? And the answer is yes. They're being assembled right now with tissue and tenons and skin but it doesn't have breath yet. But God has told us that there's a day coming when they, that, that those skeletons would come to life and breath would be put into them and they would have life and they would be filled with the spirit of God. Daniel 9, the prophecy of Daniel 9 says of Israel, there's a day when they will finish transgression, make an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and anoint the most holy place. When does this happen? It happens at the end of of the tribulation when Jesus returns and Romans eleven twenty six 26 says, and all Israel will be saved. It's declared over and over in scripture. Romans eleven twenty six 26 should be one of the easiest passages to interpret in scripture. And next week, we'll actually look at a little more detail of that passage in Romans 11 and we will, we will look at that God said that there's a future day, I thought I'd get to this tonight, but we're, we're out of time, that there's a future day when God is going to make a new covenant with whom? Jacob. Jeremiah 31 says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah on that day that I take away their sins. And we're going to look, that's the other handout that I gave you. We didn't get to it. So bring it back next week. Did everybody get one? I, I, I felt like that stack was shorter than the other stack. Did I not print all the ones that I printed? Did anybody not get one of those? You didn't get one? Are we out? I will print more. It will be in your email. That's going to come by the end of the day tomorrow as well. And then we'll, we'll cover Israel's new covenant next week wow the end times in less than a semester i love the end times because it's a study of our hope and our future and our destiny when i first was studying the end times a long time ago i used to come home and i'd tell julie it's like god's telling us what's going to happen in this world this needs to be on 60 Minutes. <laughs> 2020. Everybody needs to know about this. And I've been teaching it ever since because I think every Christian should know the hope that we have in him. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you for your promise that you will come and take us back where you are. You're preparing a place for us and you promise not to leave us in this messed up, dark world, that you have a plan, just as we pray, that your will will be done one day on earth as in, in heaven. You will come back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you will rule in re and reign in true righteousness. Lord, we look forward to that day. So whether we are part of the dead in Christ or those who are alive 
and remain. We encourage one another with this hope, with these words, that one day you will reign forever and ever. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. Great night. God's plan for the end of the age. Israel's new covenant next week. Study that sheet, by the way. You can look at all those passages. Zoom, guys. Thank you. Um, I will make sure that the handouts that we had tonight, you'll get in the email, and you'll have them by tomorrow. So you guys have a blessed week, and we'll see you all next week. I'm going to end the recording.